Welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, really happy to have you join uh, this group. This was quality education uh, and no poverty, specifically per youth employment in Africa. Uh, so some of what we'll be doing today is um, we're going to be talking through youth employment um, in, in Africa. Um, and we have several people who will be sharing their perspective, perspectives. Uh, so I will spend the first few minutes giving the welcome and objectives. Then we'll spend about an hour with a moderated conversation with panelists. Um, and then we'll spend about three to five minutes closing. Joining me today uh, is Abigail Welbeck. She is the Director of Career Services at Ashesi University. Uh, also joining me is Teddy Naluka. She's an instructor at Remote Energy. And finally, Zulu Moke Oyibo. She's a co-founder at Inkblot, um, a producer of, of several movies. And my name is Chindi Diego. I'm an associate partner at Dalberg. Uh, I'm pleased to have this conversation with you. Uh, as you know, that the theme of the conference is co-creation for global development um, and the sessions are organized using the Sustainable Development Goals Framework. Uh, so this first day of the conference will be completely virtual and the second day would have people in person in Seattle. The goal of this session is to educate you and everybody listening to think differently about uh, the SDG and find um, country-led solutions. Um, specifically, we would want to be discussed, we would want to discuss the opportunities for the youth entering the workforce. Um, as we know, Africa has the highest number of youth per population um, compared to anywhere in the world. And so how do we support the job creation um, space to ensure that a lot of youth are entering the job market and ensure that we are catalyzing inclusive growth. So we'll be using this panel to discuss what it takes to provide meaningful employment opportunities for the youth. Once again, welcome everyone um, and welcome to my panelists. So I'm going to um, open it up now to, um, for each panelist uh, to discuss what have been historically, when you think about your region or country, what have been the opportunities for youth employment? And I will be starting out with Abigail. Thank you very much, Imdi, and welcome to all our participants today. So on this side of our, uh, the world, on our side of the world in Ghana, uh, the government has rolled out some schemes to support youth employment. And the first one I'd like to highlight will be the National Service Scheme, um, where the new students who graduate from accredited tertiary institutions are uh, usually required under the law to do a one-year national service um, to the country. So across private and public sectors and across um, various sectors in, the, in their country as well as various um, institutions. And the goal is for Ghanaian students to give back to their country through service but also to serve as a, a push or a good launch into their careers. So that's one aspect of, of, of how the government is looking at supporting youth employment. But another very predominant um, sector or area that the government is also looking at is TVEC, where it's looking at technical and vocational education and training. And so this supports the government in government's industrialization agenda, um, where the ministry is committed to ensuring that Students have the practical skills necessary for success. So, a TVET qualification is usually um, a quicker way to obtain um, a, um, a qualification at a lower expense. And it's also very focused on getting you into the workforce quicker. And, and so, there are a number of initiatives that the council that manages the TVET program have rolled out or has rolled out. And so, one of it is called the Ghana TVET voucher project, where um, then it's, it's, it's supported by Ghanaian German Financial Corporation. And so it's, it's supported by the Ghana Skills Development Initiative and it had a, a funding of about 10 million euros. It also rolled out a national skills competition that looked at promoting um, training and development for industrialization specifically. And um, in the, as part of the effort in 2018, they organized Zonal and National Skills Competition in preparation for the World Skills Competition. And this is to inspire world class excellence in skills development and introduce young people to various skilled careers. 
um, offering a world of opportunity to the contestants. So that's the goal of, of the program. And also the council that manages the TVET program also looks at providing the technical universities in Ghana with world-class laboratories to meet industry standards. Um, so that's under the TVET program. Another one I want to highlight is the, the, the management of youth employment agency, which was set up um, with approval from the governing board in, in here in Ghana. It, it introduced um, a job center here in Ghana to play a very crucial role in coordinating and facilitating job placements and creation of employment opportunities for the youth of Ghana. And at its, its core mandate was to oversee the development, coordination and supervision and facilitation of the job center or job creation for the youth and related matters. And so we had an online portal, it had a job center, uh, physical location and also a training hub that handled all of that. Um, the only thing I, I'll say that it's really um, some, an area that we need to look at as a country is we don't really have very robust monitoring and evaluation systems to understand. These are things that may roll up, but to understand the impact is made um, and there's the data around it. But these are some of the, of the um, schemes that have been rolled out. What we have also is very university-led initiatives. So for us in Ashesi University, for example, we take that um, the opportunity to create industry relations that will drive employability for our students and for our graduates. And so that's very industry, um, sorry, university driven. And so if there are universities also here in Ghana who, who um, decide to take that on themselves and create the partnerships that will support graduates from the institutions to be able to get employability. But I think in a nutshell, this looks at both uh, what's happening in the, in the public domain and also in the private domain in terms of opportunities that are made available to our youth when it comes to employment. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, Abigail. Uh, I would hand it over to Teddy now to answer the same question. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would love to say that I agree with that uh, Abigail has shared. We share a lot as African countries. And uh, from the region, from the East African region, I want to transmit what has happened historically in a way of looking at how things have developed chronologically over the years. Yeah, there was uh, uh, at more than a decade ago, a decade ago, we can see that there were opportunities for youth in almost all the fields. Yeah, but with the growth of uh, the industries and growth of the different sectors, we find that there are more youth, just like uh, the statistics are showing it, more youth compared to the jobs available, the job markets. So this has been uh, a challenge. It's still a challenge in Uganda, in Kenya, in Rwanda, the countries around uh, the region in East Africa, and different uh, initiatives have come up to try to uh, eradicate or to reduce on the numbers of the unemployed youth. So we see that before uh, studying any course or program, you are assured of getting a job. This is no longer a guarantee. It has turned uh, at a, a degree of 180, if I, I could say, and we realize that there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of development of other sectors that weren't in place. This is providing opportunities. Looking at the SDG of education, the education is still relevant, but needs a bit of refining, which we have discovered that with time, most of the courses that were done by the engineering students, they come out and they are lacking hands-on. They are lacking the exposure. So many of the programs are trying to create those opportunities for these graduates that come out of the universities to adopt to that. Um, I want to emphasize a few things looking at tracking back. A, a decade ago, uh, I did electrical engineering in my class. I was one out of the eight ladies that were in the class of 80. Yeah, that shows you a lot. It was mostly a male dominated domain. But right now there are more ladies in the class. So it means that we look at the youth and the gender balance within the different uh, professions growing, especially for the girl child. So uh, renewable energy came very vibrant. I speak of renewable energy with regards to employment because I am an instructor in the solar PV. 
So before we didn't have many uh, opportunities in the renewable sector. Right now, there are lots of opportunities there that the youth are taking uh, opportunity of so that they can be able to get the jobs and to meet the demands of the market. The growth has really accelerated the youth opportunities. Uh, if I look at the frameworks that are being worked at or uh, being promoted by the government, there is a lot of push for the youth fund so that they can access finances, which are very important for creating jobs. There's lots of innovation, there's growth in IT. So there's a lot of investment in that line. Then I look at the sector, the region growing to provide opportunities for youth in the area of entrepreneurship. It has also grown quite a bit. The question now becomes the numbers. Are we having more jobs created compared to the graduates coming out of the universities? That is not yet, we are not yet there. So I think there are opportunities for youth in the region, but these are not enough so and sufficient. So development and public uh, organizations have come in place like remote energy trying to succumb and provide solutions to this so that we have more job creators than job seekers. Um, I think maybe to add on that, I would look at the fact that more youth are looking at getting equipped with skills that meet the market demand. Yeah, that is what is happening right now. Historically, it was a guarantee. Right now, it's not. Many frameworks are coming up in the government to support the same, and many private players are coming in place, and more youth are becoming more creative. So uh, that is what I could say. Thank you. Over to you, Chimde. Thank you so much, Teddy. Great to hear the common threads coming up already. Zulu? So I just want to say you're so right with the common threads coming up. Um, I feel like it's the same thing across the countries in Africa. Um, yes, um, historically, there's been opportunities um, in all spheres, in all industries. But I think maybe I should just speak specifically about my industry, the creative industry, and what is um, fantastic about the space is really that there are no barriers to entry, the very up to entry or very low barriers to entry. So the opportunity is there for any um, creative minded person to, um, who has a good idea to really just start up and, you know, go um, create their own, you know, skits, short films, whatever it is that, you know, can put them, themselves out there. Um, and once they are put out there, then there's opportunity for them to be um, haunted by, by the more experienced producers and creatives in the space who are looking for their talent. Um, so for creatives specifically, the barrier is really low. And so um, technically what we have to do as a creative person is to invest in yourself. And that is where the problems you know, arise for a lot of creatives. It's where are the resources? How can I go about doing this? Um, there are a couple of, of, of schools, you know, because education and training is paramount in, in the um, employment opportunities for youth. But you know, there's very little schools available um, for people to go to get trained in film, in filmmaking, or in, in art, in fashion, all of that. There are very few of them. Um, and so a lot of people have had to basically train themselves online. Um, thankfully, the world has become so global that, you know, you can, and so digitized that you can um, get any information that it is that you want off the internet. Um, and so that's really the challenge, and that's really the scope of things here. In addition to everything that Abigail and Teddy have said in the general view of things, but spe speaking specifically about creative view, this is what I would have to say on that. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Over to you. Thanks, Zulu. It's it's great to hear. Um, you know, we heard from Ghana to Kenya to Nigeria, and I think one thing that is coming out strongly is not just reliance on the government or private sector stakeholders, but how the youths are taking ownership of 
their opportunities. So I'm hearing a lot about vocational education so they can go on to do their own things. Um, Teddy spoke about entrepreneurship. Uh, Zulu you spoke about people investing in themselves and going out to do, um, do their own things. So it's really impressive to hear a lot across the continent about youth taking their um, their destinies into their own hands um, and not waiting for anybody. Uh, moving on to the next question, back to you, Abigail. Uh, I know you're the Director of Career Services at Ashesi University, which is um, renowned in, on the continent right now. Ashesi has an emphasis on science and technology as well as leadership development. Do you see science and technology as a growth market for youth employment in Africa? So, absolutely. That's that's a that's a short answer. <laughs> Africa is a, a close, very closely watched as the next big growth market, and even alluded to that in your introduction to the session today. And it's a description that has persisted for a while, and rightly so. There are many reasons for that optimism. The continent is home to some of the youngest populations in the world. It promises to be um, a major consumption market over the next few decades, decades, for example. Um, it is also increasingly mobile phone enabled, and which is an emerging digital ecosystem, particularly crucial or multiplying for that growth, right? And so you're looking at all of these things and the thing that, um, and even I can look at COVID-19, right? The pandemic highlighted the need to invest more in African healthcare technology, research, science leaders to strengthen our systems internally. So yes, we definitely see science and technology as a growth market for youth employment in Africa. The question is, how are we going to think about or think differently about training our youth in this area to help ensure the expected results? Um, we look across the country, we have the institutions, we have the, um, um, the technical universities, the other training institutions, but what we see around us is the impact mirroring when it comes to when it comes to solutions. Is it mirroring um, the training that is going out there, right? When we look at around us and we see the problems we are facing every day, are we seeing um, science and technology as an impact when we think of innovation and creativity? Is it actually really um, impacting this area? So I think we see it as a need, but we have to look a bit more intentionally at how we are going to see the impact, right? So at Ashesi, our educational model emphasizes on the skills needed to address problems that Africa is facing, including um, widespread poverty, et cetera, across the continent. Uh, we have learning goals that um, inform the kind of training that we give to students, both in and outside of the classroom. So our learning goals would include some um, areas like innovation and action, curiosity and skill, critical thinking, technological competence. And so we are evaluating ourselves by that, right? So if you need to look at Chef's mission to educate a new generation of ethical and entrepreneurial leaders in Africa, and it goes further to say to cultivate within our students the critical thinking skills needed, right? You have to have the skills. And then the concern for others. It's not enough to have the skill, but you have to be concerned about what is happening around you. And then also the courage to take to actually make that transformation happen, right? And so it's a, a bit more intentional in terms of the approach to things. For example, all our students um, take a, a class in coding we, because we understand that the need for technological competency. We have majors in computer, electrical, mechanical engineering, as well as computer science for those who are interested in careers in technology and in engineering. But also because of the innovation and solution oriented liberal arts approach to education. The STEM education, you can see its impact, even if you're not studying specifically any of those majors, you can see its impact in their careers regardless of their major. And I'll give you a few examples, right? We have um, some of our graduates from Denmark like Derry um, who um, started a laundry in the northern part of the country, one of the, in one of the biggest cities in the, in the north. Um, to cut costs amidst the current economic difficulties, he decided to explore um, making some of the materials that he uses. And after many tries and experiments, he developed an in house space that actually works better than the price alternatives of the market, right? And we have a similar story somewhere, as I see, 
you know, business administration um, graduates who built a solar bag, which is like uh, with OPV cells attached, right, to absorb and store energy. So in the night, the bag becomes a source of energy to power bulbs for kids to learn. And Samuel is building her business called Kania into an energy company that creates solutions for energy poor communities. And this young woman made the point to help address one of the most important global issues that we are facing in this era. Her work is very driven by an ability to um, redefine a typical African problem as an opportunity and approach the problem of developing effective technology with typical um, the, like the competencies that she's she picked up, right? And so when you look at these areas, and not just in, you know, so they're starting businesses that solve problems, but also for the graduates um, who join already established businesses, um, we also help them to grow and employ even more people. Um, so an example is like um, um, a graduate called Kofi Anyera, who graduated class of 2019, studied electrical engineering. Um, during his national service, he worked with one of Ghana's biggest electrical material manufacturers. And he performed so well that the company has now assigned him the responsibility of building the operations in three major regions in Ghana's mill build. And he's using his engineering knowledge and is also relying on the business skills he built through courses like uh, Foundations of Design and Entrepreneurship. That's one of the courses we have in the So um, there's, there's a need to have a direct correlation between the training and its impact. And I think that's something that on that side of the world, we really need to look and focus a bit more um, closely at. And when you look at, you know, some of these um, training programs that are running it, there's a lot of monitoring and evaluation to understand what's the impact. So we are training students in science and technology. How is it impacting, you know, um, their careers? How is it impacting and providing solutions to the problems that Africa is finding around itself, right? So I think there's just a, a need to be a bit more intentional. We definitely see the need. There are initiatives out there that are trying to support it, but it has to be a bit more intentional a bit more strategic and, and, and refined through monitoring and evaluation to make it really um, create the kind of results and something that we are hoping to look at. So that, that's what I'll say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Teddy, um, after that, I think it's, it's interesting because Abigail mentioned a lot about the innovations, even in the energy space. And I know you do work in training solar technicians that includes uh, several women. Do you see this space, renewables, electrical engineering, STEM broadly as a growth opportunity for women? Thank you very much, Shimri. I think uh, I'm picking it up from the right spot, you know, the right point, you know, when the thread is just right. <laughs> because as Abigail was speaking, I was thinking, okay, we need to get in touch uh, with them so that we can work out something. Remote Energy is uh, a company that promise, provides solutions for communities, energy solutions. Well, you've asked me a very good question. Uh, do we see growth opportunities? looking at these renewable and electrical um, energy programs. Yes, yes, yeah, I, I positive, I'm positive about it. And uh, I'll take you, I want you to, I want to take you to a place. If you walked into um, this community and you found women dressed in overalls and holding spanners and there are some on the roof, some are fixing things. I don't know what comes to your mind. Well, um, I see that, I see that, I work with a team that does that. Yeah, so it's amazing to see how much we can empower the women and how much they can get jobs and impact society. Um, okay, going back to 2015, when we had the first female, all female class or women only solar PV class in Kenya here, the women that graduated from that class decided to start an organization called WISE. WISE is Women in Sustainable Energy and Energy Entrepreneurship. The graduates started that to empower other women. The key objective was, was seeking to increase the number of licensed technicians, women technicians in the country. At the time, Kenya was at a state when solar PV was speaking, 
the government had put policies in place and there were so many men running after it and the women were not catching up. So we thought, okay, how do we go about it? We worked with remote energy. At the time it wasn't registered. And we could see that the numbers have grown from less than two licensed women to I could say 30 who are active in the field because they have to renew every year. And there are many others that are working in the solar PV industry. So some of these ladies are impacting society. Remote energy and wise are working on ensuring that they provide solutions that the society needs. And these are some of the solutions of productive use of energy that Abigail was expounding on. So I was really smiling when she was speaking about it. So the opportunities are there. Uh, in Kenya and in Uganda, to go for a solar PV course, you need an electrical background, at least at a diploma level. So electrical comes in handy. You're going to deal with energy. As an instructor at Remote Energy, at WISE and at Strathmore University, we see that many of the women that come for these courses actually get opportunities out there. They go to work, they get promotions. I have seen a couple of women, I work with them because I'm the chairperson of WISE and I see how they flourish out there, the confidence that they gain working in this space. Some are at advisory roles in the energy sector. Some are getting promotions at job because they have this skill set that is relevant for the needs that are need for the needs of the society and where they are. Others have started companies. Others have received licenses as vendors because you need to apply for it. And others are doing lots of installations. So these women through the STEM programs, because we go to schools installing system with our partners that are called We Share Solar. We have installed so many systems in schools and in homes, homes that are uh, for orphanages and the smiles. There are so many photos. I would, I would like to invite you to go to our website and find more, but yes, there is a lot of growth opportunity for women. We have seen growth in confidence that most of these women are confident. Now they can sit and talk. I don't know about your backgrounds, but in the energy field, if you are not well equipped, if you don't have the confidence, you can diminish in that chair. Many women sit and they can't speak. But after the training and the hands-on, they are confident enough to speak out and to contribute to society. So I would say that there are many opportunities out there. Uh, with the online programs of Report Energy, we are reaching out to more than a dozen of other women organizations in Africa. Why? Because we'd like to increase the impact of this in other countries within Africa. So we welcome women organizations to come on board. Remote Energy has also helped us change our vision towards how we deliver these technical trainings. As an instructor, we could see that there's a need to go into innovation, entrepreneurship. So we, have, we are going to pilot two projects starting next year. One, to include a leadership and entrepreneurship module or course for our technicians. Why? Because we realize we need to be job creators. We are here because of unemployment in this session, job creators. So can they graduate and get jobs? Can they start jobs and employ others? Then the other pilot project is about creating that formal pipeline of job opportunities for our graduates from these courses. Can we link them to that industry so that they are able to get the jobs that they need? That has been a challenge hands-on confidence training and getting the right skills. So Chimdi, I agree with you that there are many opportunities in this field, renewable energy field and in engineering, and we can see the fruits of empowering the women. Over to you, thank you. Thank you, that was really inspiring to hear a lot of the examples that you talked about. Zulu, you work in the creative space and I think you have a unique position as an employer. So you've seen how the creative sector across the world, um, but especially in Africa, has been attracting more young people. Um, that said, you started touching on a few things early on, on it has low barriers to entry, but there are issues. I think one of the issues people have talked about is the um, 
gig form of the sector. How do you think the sector can become more inclusive and provide stability for the youth seeking entry into the sector? Um, thank you for the question, Jim D. Um, so yes, like I said, barrier to entry is very low. So already opportunities are, are vast in the sector. However, to be able to grab that opportunity, the filmmaking is not, is, it's not easy in the sense that you need access to funds. Um, to be able to create and to create well, to compete with your peers and globally as well, you need access to funds. And that has always been the major issue for a lot of people coming into the space. But what I find is that a lot of um, youth are uh, super collaborators, which I think comes to the topic for this uh, convention. It's co-creation, right? And we are super collaborators in the film space because it really, you can't do anything on your own, even if you have the best idea. So a way to you know, go around the access to funds is always to have a good partnership with various um, creatives um, and try and bring out a film or try and create some kind of art, whatever type of art you're trying to create. Um, but other than that, um, when you come into the space, you now have a different struggle of how stable is your career in this space. Um, we find that the creative industry is very, very informal, um, very fragmented. And so we need structure. Um, a couple of companies might by themselves decide to create some sort of structure so that anyone coming into the space, anyone coming under their employment is able to see a career path. But for the most part, you find that a lot of these businesses are one-man businesses, a lot of these businesses are unable to provide that stability. They are unable to even also give um, the employees the resources that they need to branch out and start things on their own as well. So it's really very dicey. Um, what I believe needs to happen really, I think I've said, I've given the answers in the, in, in the response I've given already, is that we need to formalize the sector. Um, we need to have more structure. We need to make people realize that when they're in the space, yes, it's a creative space. And um, for, for the most part, creatives aren't business-minded. They aren't structured people. But we need to be able to create a structure um, by way of unions, for instance, um, where people know that this is the certain type of, of fee that you, this is a certain range of fee that you get for a certain type of, um, film that you create and things like that. So um, generally, yes, there is so much opportunity for um, the youth to come in, but it really is, it's a different ball game when you come in here. And I, I really just, I mean, the government has tried, the government continues to try to um, provide access to funds and things like that. But then for a creative, when you have something like collateral, you know, as the barricade to access those funds, it becomes an issue because as a young person, how much collateral have you, made, have you been able to gather in your lifetime? So um, yes, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, but when it comes to the inclusive, the inclusive nature of the creative sector, it's fully open to everyone. Um, women are very well, they're doing so fantastically in the space. Um, I like to boast that in Nigeria, of, of the top five highest grossing films, it's produced by women. Um, so yeah, it's, um, there's a lot to be happy and thankful for, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Great. Um, it's interesting because across three of you, I, one common theme I'm hearing is working across the ecosystem and building strong linkages. So Abigail mentioned training that is very practical um, and can ensure that you know, the students are innovating and bringing something to the market that is relevant. Um, Teddy mentioned the need to link graduates to the industry 
Secretary uh, Zulu mentioned the importance of having good partnerships. So there's something around ensuring that you're working across the ecosystem and those linkages are really strong. That would really help uh, us uh, you know, in whatever sector, because you you are all working across various sectors, and that's that's a strong theme that I'm hearing. Um, follow up question, Abigail. I am curious as to the types of jobs, like when you talk about formal jobs that your graduates are going into, um, and what type of employment opportunities are not available for your graduates in Africa that you think should be available. Okay, so I'd like to look at this in two different, from two different lenses, right? So the first is, yes, we are looking at, you know, what is ahead of us, but even with the current opportunities that exist is how can we build on those opportunities to give our, our graduates and our students more opportunities? So. When you look at, I've talked about the training being a very solution focused, right? But also along with that is giving them, the youth, the opportunity to solve problems, right? Because you can learn about something and then just trying it out. There's not a lot of opportunity to innovate and to make mistakes and to correct your mistakes and even funding to support, like, you know, venture incubators, et cetera. So there has to be a lot more in the system that encourages our graduates and our students to be able to innovate and to, to provide solutions to problems and to test out prototypes and things you're thinking of, of, of coming up with. So there has to be a bit more, once again, intentionality around that area. And then when you look at areas like agriculture, which I think Africa should really focus a lot on, on that because we have the potential, right? And um, you look at the kind of challenges that are being faced but in that sector, and a huge part could be mechanized farming, right? It's how could we look at that? You know, it's a great opportunity to make sure that our, our farm produce are not, you know, we are, we're getting we're getting results in that area as well, right? And also just looking at food and farm produce storage solutions, right? Is how can we support our, our youth to, to think creatively and innovatively, in, innovatively, sorry, about some of these problems and come up with solutions because we can't them going into um, engineering, you know, getting in, you know, whether it's on a diploma level, a degree level, etc. You know, but how is it translating into actual solutions in some of these areas? And I think we need to look at that first before we even look at moving <laughs> forward from here, from there. So yes, that that's an area to look at. But also when we look, we're looking, you know, into the future. We're looking at areas like green job pathways that we can consider, alternative energy issues around climate change and how to innovate also around um, that area. Um, and then I can even give you a, an example is as Jesse's work in, in climate, we, we started something, but obviously there's more room for improvement and we're looking at the next decade, decade to look at um, climate transition policy advocacy, increasing awareness around you know, the climate um, situation. Um, and also bringing climate experts onto our faculty team to integrate climate change content across the curriculum for our students. So that's a bit more, we can also look at these kind of areas. Um, and also when it comes to application of new and disruptive technologies, opportunities in artificial intelligence, augmented reality, mobile learning, micro learning, learning analytics, social, emotional learning modules, automation, etc. This is where the world is going to us, but how ready are we as a, as a country and as a continent to be able to support our students with those kind of skills, the opportunity to let them grow once they develop the skills and to let them innovate to help um, bring solutions to the problems that we face around us. So it's, it's I mean, there's definitely opportunity, but we need to really look and see how we can begin to, to create more robust systems and structures around learning, around um, innovation, to create solutions, um, and to give more opportunity to our, our youth and, and, and our graduates. That's my submission on, on that topic. Thank you. Fantastic. Teddy, you talked a lot about your work supporting women. 
what needs to happen to close the gender gap in STEM? STEM, what needs to happen? Um, yes, a lot needs to happen, but maybe um, I'll just point out a few, a few areas that I think could be of focus yeah, moving forward so that we can bridge that gap. Uh, when we run our courses online and we ask people to log into the women only uh, programs and trainings, most of the women log in and they express their gratitude to being part of that class. Why? Because they feel more comfortable being in those classes. Yeah. And not because they don't like men, yeah, but it feels more you that you're going to work without having any intimidation, which sometimes is passed without intention. So they are happy to be a part of that. So we think that having more of such could also bridge the gap that many more ladies will get into this field and they will flourish and grow because we have seen transformation through training. Um, we, from the research that also we've done from those online courses, we realized that opening up such opportunities for women can increase the numbers to almost fivefold. Yeah. So we can explore these opportunities so that we can bring more women on board. Then there is a barrier of lacking the right or outstanding role models in STEM. Yeah. Sometimes there are not so many and maybe it's very intimidating to the young girls looking for. So we think having women instructors, women installers as role models it helps to create that confidence in the little girls yeah, and in the university students that this can really happen. I have had, I mentor university students, most of them are girls, and some of them are very proud to know that as a girl, you can actually do solar PV installations because they think culturally in some sectors, you can't even think about it. How do you get on that roof? You know, it's a, almost a taboo. But then we have seen this happening. And when our Installers from Wise go to do the job. The girls look up to them and ask them, "How can I be like you?" Yeah. So I think this will bridge the gap as well because it's been tested, and for us, we have seen that it can bridge the gap. Yeah. Then um, we're thinking about the issue of hands-on trainings. We need to have more trainings, technical trainings, to provide the right technical skills to our women, yeah, who are engaged in these fields. Many graduate from engineering, but very little practical hands-on is done there. And I think with this, I agree with Abigail. If we do train and provide skill sets that solve specific problems, that are problem solvers, that are aimed at productive use, we shall bridge that gap because then we can see the women also taking part in this, providing them those skills. So what we do, with remote energy, we provide hands-on sessions on how to use tools, on how to use the climb the roof, on how to install, so they grow in that confidence. And that's how many of them have managed to apply for licenses. And then we talk about coaching and mentoring. It can also bridge the gap because we know it works. Yeah, we know it's one of those that gives you. We are getting coaching left, right, and center in all kinds of fields. So we think it's also very important, and it could bridge that gap that exists when you come to women and engagement in STEM. Yeah, um, there is a, there's a recent graduate, just to share a brief story. I think uh, I might have a few minutes for that. And she was telling me she went to work in one of the big organizations here and she felt a bit intimidated because she's a graduate of electrical engineering. She went and was interviewed to deal with projects related with solar, with irrigation and all that. And she does not even remember how to hold a spanner. So she was telling me, I need help like yesterday. <laughs> yeah. so, so getting in touch with Saj, there are many out there. We can bridge the gap because instead of becoming administrators, then they are the installers, instructors, and trainers. Yeah, so I think that answers the, the question, bridges the gap. Uh, lastly, I would say training, these women and all youth to be job creators, job creators and to seek all these innovative facilities so that they can create more jobs to empower more youth and also to impact society. Thank you, Chimdi. Thank you, Teddy. It's interesting you talked a lot um, 
about the hands-on training and, and supporting um, this woman. Zulu, as an employer in the creative industry, when you think about what kind of skills you're looking for, what are those things and how can we ensure to this point that people are adequately prepared to leverage the growth of the creative industry? Um, so as an employer, I'm looking for two things, fresh voices and skilled labor. It's really that simple. Um, but what is a fresh voice? Everyone thinks of stories as, oh, it's just a story, it's just an idea, it's easy. But there's a technicality to storytelling and there's a technicality to script writing for film. Um, and that's the basis of all film, that's the foundation. Um, and a lot of people do not understand that. So coming into the space, oh, I have this idea, and then they tell you a story, and you, you see it's not commercial, or it's not even, you can't, it doesn't have a structure, because the story needs a structure, for instance. So what I would need, what I would hope to see, to leverage the growth of the industry, I would, for one, need um, more education and training. Um, of any interested parties in the space. There's so much to learn. There is script writing, there is cinematography, there is directing, producing. Um, so many, there's costuming, there is makeup. You know, there's a lot of, of opportunity to learn. And I would need to see more, um, more education, more attention to education being paid because you need to have that base level of knowledge of what the kind of job you're coming to do is. And it's not just, oh, like you said earlier, Chindi, a geek, you know? Um, it's actually important stuff. And in that education, I need reorientation as well. I need people to see the creative space as good business because the creative space is what um, you use through film, through art, to whatever, to expose your culture, to promote your culture. Um, for any country in the world, this is what you use. The reason why we all want to be in a beautiful ball gown type wedding dress, coming down a massive staircase on our wedding day is because of things like Cinderella, you know, and that's orientation. So we need orientation as well, you know, just to let people know that creatives are important to the society and they're a very big leg to promote um, the, the values, the culture that any society has. I would also need, you know, the thing is when you create, you want to be able to exploit your creation. You want to be able to get the highest value for the work that you've put out. Digitization is great, but it's also opened our eyes to the kinds of, um, to the imbalance basically in, in in our own, how we, what's the word now? How we uh, pay ourselves, basically. Um, how we value, thank you, that's the word I was looking for. How we value our own products, our own films. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really affects that is piracy. Piracy in the space, we need to tackle that because Film, like, like I said, you need to exploit your film for you to want to continue to make it, for you to see any value, for you to see, for there to be any sustainability of any kind. You will need to make, um, make some profit off the stuff that you've made and put it into the next venture that you go into. So um, I'd like to see, you know, to be able to leverage the growth of the industry, I'd like to see um, the government pay very great attention to the internet services. Um, I think it's also an African issue um, because for, we, we can see that we're all going online now with the streamers like, uh, you know, popular streamers that you know, um, coming into spaces and for any um, consumer to be able to watch your film on those streaming platforms, they need that infrastructure to work well. Um, also infrastructure to exhibit your film, your art, whatever it is, film and um, cinemas, around the country, just so that there is a, there's an actual viable marketplace for um, creative entrepreneurs to exploit their, their films. Um, that's really it. There's a lot to, to learn from other, other countries, other cultures. There's a lot of knowledge transfer that we would need to 
to um, partake in through co-creation, cross-country co-creation. So with South Africans, with Rwandans, Kenyans, with Ghanaians, you know, we need such collaborative efforts. We need to be more Pan-African in our thinking, I think, um, especially because now this is what they call the last frontier. Um, everyone is looking into this space. Hollywood studios are coming to shoot films here um, in Africa, I mean, not, not just Nigeria. And so to be able to leverage on that, we need to, you know, have, we need to also be as skilled, you know, and we need to be able to put out the things, we need to be able to put out films and art that level up to the standards that are already enjoyed by consumers worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. The last question I'll be asking everybody is, I would want you all to paint a picture, right? So I assume that you're optimistic about the future of youth employment opportunities in Africa. Um, and based on that assumption, I would like you to paint a picture, whether in your country, in your sector, um, in, in the region of the ideal youth employment landscape in the next decade. Um, so if you had the blank slate, what would it look like for the youth employment landscape? Abigail? So, very optimistic about the future of the youth, uh, of youth employment opportunities in Africa. Very, very optimistic because we have the potential. Africans are intelligent. We have the opportunities. We have the youth. You mentioned that it's home to some of the youngest populations in the world. They are ready and super and ready to create change. We just need the system, the support system. The, the other um, continents and countries have opportunity, but they have systems, right? And that's something that we are, we need to be able to look at a bit more intentionally. Apart from that also, it just will also take a lot of intentionality and learning and relearning, right? A commitment to excellence. And very importantly, a change in mindset. Um, and once it's like a change in mindset, it automatically leads to behavioral change. But what do I mean by this? It talks a lot about skill development, which is really critical. But, and you know, you can have the skills necessary right for, for what is needed and maybe you do me um allude to this right because you're an employer you can teach someone skill but what you cannot teach is behavior and character right and so our youth are, are, are looking at the examples that are being um that are out there for them right so we need our, our leadership and our our government to lead by example, right? The government and the leadership to do the right thing, to act with integrity. Um, if young people are growing up and all they're saying, seeing around them is that the corrupt way of doing things is the norm and it's okay and there's no accountability, that is the mindset they grow with. And it's really hard to change mindset at a certain point. So there has to be a lot of leadership by example. So, because I can have the skill to excel in a particular field. But I have a, if I have a terrible character, nobody's going to be able to work with me. I'm not going to be able to get back, right? And so there has to be a lot of, of, of you know, work also look, looking at that area, right? It's, it's how do we let them see the right kind of behavior going up so that they module that. And that's what they also um, module when they go into these organizations to create the change to act with integrity, to be concerned about others. It's not enough to, to have the skills, but how are you concerned about, you know, you can all say, oh, that's not my issue, that's not my case. I mean, or I can just travel and leave the country and go outside and still be in a process. But the concern for others in the community, you know, to create change, to innovate, to and provide solutions to the, the problems we find around ourselves, is also really critical. So, skill development is good, but there's a lot also that we have to look at when it comes to behavior, mindset change, um, concern for others, etc. And I think something that was also mentioned um, by Zulu is collaboration. It's really, really key. 
lots of collaboration across institutions, across uh, institutions, not just locally, but across the continent, because we all have really, and I think even today's um, session is a typical example where we, we till today we're now learning a bit more about each other's work and institutions and how there's a lot of synergy and uh, potential for collaboration. It's how can we do that in a very intentional way so that we can support our youth um, in some of the, the great ideas that we have, that some of which we're already implementing in our institutions, or not just in our institutions, but even supporting other um, organizations and, or smaller institutions um, to also um, roll out for, for other youth who may not be as privileged to be in, in higher ed institutions. And so a lot of collaboration, not just collaboration between institutions, but also industry, institutions, government, you know, all, everybody has to be part of, as a key stakeholder in this process, you know, policy makers, etc. for us to see how we can move forward in the right direction. Um, and, and lastly, what I'll say is also um, just monitoring and evaluation. We can't just keep on creating and rolling out initiatives, but we need to be able to understand whether it's actually meeting the needs and use that information to also inform program requirements, you know, and, and making it better and scaling it up to um, to reach more people and more youth, right? So there's a lot more. When it comes to Africa looking for data, we all know the situation with that. So there also has to be, data is not just information out there, but it, it, it helps to understand whether what you're doing is actually yielding results and how you can make it even better for greater success. So yes, very optimistic, but there's a lot of commitment to excellence that has to go along with that and a lot of behavior change, mindset change, a lot of unlearning and relearning to ensure that we get to the place and all the points we need to get to. But it's possible. It is definitely possible, that much I'll say. So thank you very much. Great. Teddy? Thank you so much, Yumdi. And I think um, as a, a renewable energy enthusiast, I would like to take that angle. And I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic because we have the resources, for example, solar, we have it. We have the youth, yeah, the numbers are in the statistics and the youth bring along a lot of wealth. Yeah, We have seen how youth are creative, they're innovative, they're agile. They are all these things that maybe some employers find very hard to deal with, but I think they can also be remodeled in a way that can be contained. So we need to create an ecosystem that gives them an opportunity to work. Yeah, that is through the partnerships that have been mentioned and all the other enabling, um, all other situations that enable the environment. Enabling environment is very important for the youth. And uh, I want to paint a picture that uh, is talking about uh, gender equality and inclusivity. Yeah, uh, that it's all youth, even the marginalized, we know we have people who live in very difficult situations, yeah, but that these opportunities are open, yeah, because that gives a lot of hope to all the youth to know that I don't have access to the funds, already Zulu mentioned it, but there is a way out. So I paint that picture. I paint a picture that has equal opportunities for all, yeah, in all fields. I'm speaking about solar because I train and, uh, you know, but all fields, yeah. Here we have seen that each one of us is in a different field, but opportunities for everyone in all fields. I want to paint a picture of women engaging in all kinds of, um, let's say industries, especially the energy and from the level of decision makers to the installers, yeah. I'd like to see job creators, women in particular, because from our installations that we do as wise, Many people comment that we do a better job. Yeah, I know we are, have a, a night to detail, things look nice and then they are more sustainable. I have no, I, I mean, I love the men very much, but this is uh, something that I think should be shared, yeah? So I want women that could be job creators for others, not only for fellow women, but for everyone. Job creators in the field of energy because there are possibilities. I'd like to invite, um, all of us here to maybe visit that website of remote energy, remote learning solutions. From there, you're going to see the impacts, the impacts that this is bringing to the lives of different women all over Africa. 
And if there are any areas of partnerships, please reach out because this is what we want to increase our impact within Africa. I also want to paint a picture of youth who have their own, you know, who have their own companies, who are doing mentoring, who are reaching out to the girl child and empowering all the youth along the whole chain and the life, life cycle of a person. Because we see that there are gaps, there are gaps. There are some ladies when they get married, they don't plug into any more in certain jobs, then later they pick it up. Can we see how, how do we work that out? Because we need to plug into the system. So I'm very optimistic, Chimdi, I don't know. And I think we are headed in the right direction if we empower other women so that they can be job creators. If we reach out through all these programs, entrepreneurship programs, leadership programs, uh, we are going to create a difference. And all those behavior change that uh, Abigail is talking about, all those uh, factors that are hindering the youth from reaching the goal and from delivering at the workplaces, we shall curb them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teddy. On to you, Zulu, um, really counting on your picture and storytelling right now of how you- Oh, wow. You <laughs> put me on the spot, yeah? <laughs> um, so I think, I think I would just give an example. Um, there's a group of filmmakers called Ikorodu Boys in Nigeria currently. And I don't think the oldest is up to 17. And what they normally do is they make skits online and um, they will take like the trailer of a Hollywood blockbuster and they will reenact the trailer. Now these guys are from, you know, they are products of like low income areas in Nigeria. So what they would use is something like a wheelbarrow. Instead of having like a track and dolly to roll the camera back and forth to create that motion and uh, movement, you know, in, in the film, they would use a real wheelbarrow to push their camera. They are very creative, just being who they are with the resources that they have. Um, what happened was they did this so well, so with such talent that um, they got international acclaim so much so that Netflix um, recognized them and put them in one of their Nigerian original films, right? That is the type of thing I'm hoping to see. I think that's it in a nutshell. I want to see people with talent have an enabling environment that catalyzes their creativity. I want to see a structured, a structured industry. I want to see an industry with easy access to funds an industry with full government support, you know, when, when it comes to things like tax rebates, which helps, you know, with the funds, which is the biggest issue amongst creatives. I want to see the government tackle piracy. I want to see an industry that is able to compete, you know, head to head with global counterparts. That's what I want to see. And I think that there is a lot of opportunity already, like I said, because of the low barriers to entry. And there's so much talent in, our youth. Our youth are super talented. By whatever means, they make things happen. And I'm just hoping that they find that environment to thrive in. And that's, that's my, my dream for the future. Thank you, Zulu. I have I spent the past... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've spent the past one hour learning but also smiling because I've been inspired and a lot of what has been said resonates deeply with me and leaves me with a lot of hope and optimism for the future. Some things that struck, struck me personally was the common thread we kept talking about collaboration and linkages and there was something even around cross-country learnings. How can we walk together across a continent, across sectors. Um, I'm already hearing some threads even um, within this conversation right now of possible um, collaboration happening in the future. There's something around practical training. How do we ensure that um, the youths are trained in a way that is hands-on, practical, and something that they can actually take into the workforce easily? Um, something that struck me is the focus on women works. Um, so it was great to hear um, 
a lot around the program centered around women and how that actually helped. Um, so how do we ensure that, you know, that creates a positive reinforcement mechanism to encourage more women to come into sectors where they've been excluded from? Um, something that resonates, and I think this is typical so many times, access to funds is important. Um, we cannot overemphasize that. Um, it's important on so many levels. Um, and finally, the fifth thing that resonated strongly with me is that monitoring, monitoring and evaluation is really critical for initiatives to monitor, um, to ensure that we're monitoring impact and we're able to um, track things. Um, Thank you so much, Abigail, Zulu, and Teddy. It's been really great spending the past hour with you, learning um, and just getting up to speed as to, on all the knowledge that you have. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was insightful for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Chimdi, thank you for taking us through. And uh, nice to meet you, Abigail and Zuru. I yes. look forward. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.